on RN, this is Counterpoint. Hello, I'm Michael Duffy. And I'm Paul Comrie Thompson. It's good to be back. And we're looking forward to presenting throughout the year a range of ideas, issues and guests that we hope will challenge and question the conventional wisdom. Yes, we'll be offering dissenting viewpoints, taking on a few sacred cows and hopefully having a bit of fun along the way. Now, for people who haven't heard the show before, I should say we're not particularly conservative, even though we do sometimes get listeners' abuse to that effect. You're saying those listeners are wrong, Michael? Well, Jared Henderson thinks so. Recently, he published his annual article complaining that there are no conservative presenters on the ABC. Yes, maybe you confused him that time you voted for the Greens. <laughs> it's a possibility. On the other hand, Eric Beach has described the program recently as eclectic, and I think I like eclectic. As it happens, we're going to start the year with a guest from the right, but so far to the right, you certainly couldn't call him conservative. I'm not sure what you'd call him. He's right out of the ideological ballpark. His name's Hans Hermann Hopper, and he's a German intellectual who lives in America. He's going to propose ways of thinking about government, society and the economy that are literally radical. And I think in this case, Michael, the word literally is being used literally. Indeed it is. Jolly good. Now, later in the program, we have Australian historian Geoffrey Blaney. He says Christianity has been at the core of Western civilization, but we know less and less about it. To address this knowledge gap, he wrote a book launched late last year. It is entitled A Short History of Christianity. That's coming up later on Counterpoint here on RN. But now let's hear a libertarian voice. Hans Hermann Hopper is probably the world's leading living libertarian philosopher. He's Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and a distinguished fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Perhaps his best-known book appeared about a decade ago, and it had the challenging title, Democracy, The God That Failed. His critique was from the libertarian right. Now, libertarians are part of a pretty broad church, so how would Hermann Hans Hopper describe his position? Just where is he coming from? I am a libertarian, but there exist various wings of libertarians. I am a member of the wing that is referred to as the anarcho-capitalist libertarians, or as I prefer to say, I'm a proponent of a private law society. <laughs> uh, and a private law society is a society where the same laws uh, apply to every individual and every institution, not just uh, s separate groups of individuals, government officials on the one hand, and private citizens on the other, to whom different laws apply. In, in general terms, is there one particular place that you're coming from? Is there a sort of fixed point where you start whenever you consider a new subject or a problem? I mean, is, are you interested in freedom, for example? Of course I'm interested in freedom. I think freedom is defined precisely by the position uh, that I take that every individual and every institution is subject to exactly the same law uh, and there is no uh, group of individuals or no particular individual that uh, has certain privileges that other people do not have. Okay, well let's apply those beliefs to what you've written about the differences or the comparison between democracy and monarchy. Now, I suspect most of our listeners would consider that democracy is a marked improvement and a dramatic difference from monarchy. How do you see the two? First, first you have to define a state because monarchies as well as democracies are states. And then in the second step, we have to explain, so to speak, what the difference between these two types of uh, states are uh, states are defined as institutions that are the ultimate arbiter in cases of conflict uh, on a certain territory, including conflicts involving the state itself. And secondly, states are territorial monopolies of taxation. So this applies both to monarchies and to uh, democracies. Um, in monarchies, the head of the state uh, considers the territory, so to speak, as his private property and uh, the people inhabiting uh, the state territory as his renters who owe him rent payments. And of course, he uses his 
privilege that he has as the ultimate arbiter in any case of conflict and the person who has the right to tax individuals to his own advantage. He exploits his population. Now, this is also true in a democracy. Uh, taxation exists in a democracy just as much as it exists in uh, in, demo in uh, under monarchy. Uh, states also, democ democratic states also assume that they are the ultimate arbiter in any case of conflict, including conflicts involving themselves. The fundament, and there is a distinction uh, in democracy also between uh, public law and private law. Public officials under democracy can do many things that private individuals in their private dealings would not be permitted to do. Uh, they can tax individuals on a private level. This would be called stealing. Uh, they can tax individuals and redistribute income in the private level that would be considered uh, stealing and fencing of stolen uh, stolen goods. Uh, <laughs> they can draft people into the army or force them to work for the state, which in a, on a private level would be con considered uh, enslaving people or kidnapping uh, people. Um, but people choose this, don't they? People vote for democracy, for democratic governments. Uh, be, yes, that, that brings me to the difference between democracy and, uh, and the monarch. Um, under under monarch, monarchy, it is relatively clear who the ruler is and who the ruled are. Under democracy, you can hope that you will end up on the other side, that you will be on the receiving end, and that reduces, so to speak, the resistance against increases of taxes, against uh, unjust verdicts in in conflicts of a situation. But the most important difference between monarchy on the one hand and democracy on the other, on the other hand is uh, that uh, you replace, so to speak, somebody who considers himself to be the owner of the country with somebody who is a temporary caretaker of the country. And that does not improve matters. It makes matters much worse. To give you an example, uh, if I give you a house, in, in one situation, I make you the owner of the house, uh, so you can determine who will be the heir, you can sell the house off and keep the receipts from the sale. And in the other case, I make you the temporary user of the house. Uh, you can use to your own advantage uh, the income that you can get off the house, but you have no right to sell the house. You have no right to determine who will be the heir of the house. Will you treat the house in a different way? And the answer seems to be quite clear. Yes, you will treat it in a very different way. In the one case, as the owner, you will be interested in preserving the value, uh, the capital value embodied in the house. Uh, in, the other, in, in the other case, as a democratic politician, where you can only use the house but don't own it, uh, you will try to increase your income uh, that you can get from the house without any regard to the capital value embodied in the house, but and you will engage in capital consumption. You yeah. want to rob the country as fast as possible because after four years or eight years you have no chance anymore uh, to do it. So it is far more destructive of wealth formation than monarchies. But are. isn't it the case, using your analogy, that if because of elections, if I want to keep the house, keep my control of the house at the end of a period of four or five years, I have to act within certain limits. In other words, um, elected rulers have to, even if they do exploit people a bit, they have to keep that exploitation within boundaries in the hope of being re-elected. But, but this is also true for, uh, for monarchs. Um, monarchs have frequently been killed uh, if they overstep their boundaries. And the, dy the dynasty of which they are a member is very much interested in, yeah, in keeping the dynasty in power. Democrats are far less frequently uh, killed because people always have the hope, so to speak, that in four years somebody else will come to power. Uh, so the resistance against attempts to increase government power, to increase the amount of taxes, is far lower under de democratic conditions than it is under uh, monarchical conditions. And, and in addition, it should be said that competition for 
entry into government. Competition is not always good. Competition is good when it comes to the production of things that are good. Uh, we do not want to have a milk monopolist. We do not want to have a car monopolist. We do want to have competition in the milk industry and in the car industry. But competition is not good when it comes to producing something that is bad from the point of view of property owners. Mm. Uh, and uh, we would not want to have competition in people who run the best concentration camp, who is uh, the best mugger on the street. <laughs> uh, and this is precisely the type of competition that we have in democracy. It's a case, isn't it, that, that democracies on the whole have higher standards of living than other forms of government, and also the case that many people who do not live in democracies would like to, to the extent that, that we can gauge what they want. Why is that so, do you think? Are people deluded to want to live in democracies? Uh, democracies have, so to speak, won out in competition against monarchies in the course of history. Uh, the monarchical age has ended by and large with the end of World War I. So it would be unfair to say that democracies are, in fact, richer than monarchies because we compare then the 19th and 18th century with the 20th century. Uh, societies can grow richer despite the fact that governments grow richer. So my thesis would be if we would have kept monarchies of the style that uh, we had in the 19th and 18th century, we would be far richer than we are currently under democratic uh, under democratic conditions. Moving on, what might a libertarian society look like? How might it organise itself? The basic idea is that if every institution, every person is subject to the same set of laws, then also the production of law and order has to be provided by freely financed uh, institutions. There is no monopoly institution uh, in this place. This would lead to a, uh, a situation where we would indeed get some sort of contract uh, of what will happen to us in certain situations of conflict, what the provider of security of law and order will do. Uh, they, they will have to describe what it is that they will protect, how will they protect it, what will they do in a case of a conflict between a client of a company protecting agency and the agency itself, what will happen in the case that two uh, security providers and their clients have conflicts with each other, they will have to agree for instance, that there will be independent arbitration in case of conflicts between various protecting agencies, whereas if you compare it with the current situation, uh, we, have, we have a situation where no contract exists between the citizens that are allegedly protected uh, in their lives and their property by the government, uh, where it is not clear uh, what will happen if the clients, the so-called clients of the state, are dissatisfied with the provisions that the state um, uh, gives, um, where the clients have no possibility of uh, appealing to independent third parties if it comes to a conflict between the state and the individual, uh, where in instead we have a situation where if you have a conflict with the state, some state agent, uh, over property rights. Uh, it is another state agent who decides who is right and who is wrong in this case of of conflict. Okay. And there you well, can predict, of course, what the outcome will be. They will, by and large, decide that they are always right. Mm. Well, can I ask you for an example? What happened? I mean, I live in Sydney. Say uh, there was a law here in, in, your, in this sort of world you're describing. Say there was a law and... Uh, you know, everyone else agreed with it, but I didn't. So if, for example, I live in a street and I've got a one-hour parking sign out the front and I disagreed with that, but the other people in the street agreed with it, what might happen then? I'm just well, trying to get the, a concrete the, idea the, of this. The, the, the street would be privately owned. Mm -hmm. um, 
in a private law society, there exists no such thing as public property. Mm. There exists only private property. And of course, the owner of the private property lays down the rules that apply uh, to this uh, yeah. piece of private property. So conflicts like this would not even arise. Public property, on the other hand, uh, generates uh, conflicts. Allegedly, we all own it. Uh, if we do not happen to agree as if by magic, uh, conflicts are almost unavoidable. If the unions want to demonstrate on the street and the car drivers want to drive on the street, uh, both claim to be owners of, uh, of this territory. Uh, conflict is unavoidable. If everything is privately owned, it is perfectly clear whose rules apply and whose rules do not apply. Mm. So if I own a house in a street... Uh, would that street belong to all the people in the neighbourhood or to another company, or how would that work, maybe? Uh, that can be arranged uh, in in various ways. Uh, it might be owned by all uh, residents on, on the street. Uh, it might be owned by a third party, and you have the right to access your property. Obviously, nobody would buy any property if he did not have... Uh, the right to access his own property, so you would have a contract, so to speak, with with the person who owns the street, right. or or they are uh, neighborhood uh, uh, associations that jointly own on the street and make joint decisions, as in stock companies or as in gated communities right. or institutions of that kind. And if I didn't agree with them, I could leave. Basically, I could and sell my you house. Could, and then move. you could leave. Right. Yes. In Australia, we have. Um, a large number of people who are on welfare, you know, poor people who are looked after by what we call the welfare state, possibly uh, more than in America. What would happen to those people under the sorts of arrangements you've been describing? Uh, first of all, I think that uh, a large number of voluntary organisations would spring up. Voluntary donations would dramatically increase given the fact that no taxes have to be paid. Currently, the situation is such that you pay pay massive amounts of taxes and then people of course have the feeling why should I also support people who have this condition or that condition uh, given that I'm already paying an enormous sum of uh, taxes. Uh, second, I think there would be greater pressure exerted on people not to become dependent on welfare because they are not entitled to it. They would have to behave in such a way that they satisfy their donors in some way. They have to be nice to their donors, whereas currently the situation is you feel entitled to these things, and that breeds, of course, bad behavior. Uh, whatever you subsidize through taxes, you will get more of it. If you support poor people, this does not eliminate poverty, it increases poverty. It makes the in increases the incentive to stay poor or to become poor. Uh, whenever you subsidize people because they suffer from drug addiction or alcoholism, you increase these types of, uh, these forms of behavior instead of discouraging them. Do you think the welfare state can survive? No, the welfare state will ultimately collapse for the same reason that communism collapsed. Uh, all Western welfare states will not be able to repay their debts, will not be able to fulfill their uh, obligations that they have assumed vis-à-vis -vis people who are retiring. The only way that they can fulfill it is by engaging in massive amount of inflation that is printing printing up the money uh, in order to give the impression that they might fulfill the obligation with the consequence, of course, um, that uh, purchasing power of money drastically, drastically falls and an expropriation of productive individuals will take place. Mm. I'd like to ask you a bit more about economics, but unfortunately we don't have a, a lot of time left. But just very general, can you tell us um, a few of your most important thoughts about how you think the international financial system ought to be arranged differently? The m fundamental problem that we have, which began uh, in the most drastic form since 1971, is that all 
governments are nowadays on a pure paper money paper money standard. All governments or their central banks can create money out of thin air. Increasing the amount of money in existence uh, does not increase wealth in society. It is just additional pieces of paper. There is not one additional consumer good resulting from more money being printed. There is not one additional producer good resulting from more money being being printed. If by money printing we could make society society is richer, there would not be a single poor society. In fact, there would not be a single poor person on uh, on earth. All that this money printing does, it is it redistributes income and uh, and wealth from those people who print and get and spend the money first, and it impoverishes and expropriates those people who do get the newly printed money last, who are on fixed incomes and are confronted with rising prices resulting from the fact that additional money was uh, was being printed. So the most important monetary reform that we can hope for would be the abolishment of all central banks and the return to a situation that existed for most of mankind, namely a situation where money is a regular commodity that must be in a costly way produced, such as gold and silver, by the market. Uh, Again, no monopoly in the uh, production of money, but competition in the production of money, and money being a regular commodity that cannot be generated out of sin, out of sin okay. air. What about the role of intellectuals? Uh, we've never had anyone like yourself on our program before, and, and that is disappointing. Why don't more people think like you, or at least engage in more diverse thinking about freedom? Now, the answer to that one is very easy. Uh, most intellectuals are state employees, uh, and of course they know where their money comes from. Um, now, while uh, that fact does not determine in the Marxist way how people think, it it definitely helps to know, so to speak, where your money comes from. Uh, the demand for intellectual services on the market is far lower uh, than uh, than the impression that intellectuals themselves try uh, try to spread. Uh, their salaries would probably be significantly less. There would be significantly less so-called intellectuals um, because uh, they realize that their biggest helper is a state. They tend to be in favor of state institutions, tend to be in favor of having public education, public funding for research. Uh, Again, most research that is being done, especially in the social sciences, appears to me as a big waste of a big waste of money. Societies would be richer if many of these so called research projects would never have been carried out at all. Professor Hopper, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Hans Hermann Hopper is Emeritus Professor of Economics, University of Nevada, and a distinguished fellow at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. In coming weeks here on CounterPoint, we'll be talking to another prominent libertarian, David Hart. He's an Australian historian, now resident in the US, a self-described ultra-skeptic who runs the important website, the Online Library of Liberty. And we'll hear his views on freedom, war, and the growth of the state. On RN, this is CounterPoint. CounterPoint.